from the current slide. Okay, yeah, well, it's trying to decide whether it's going to stay up or not. Now, the only other announcement that I would want to make, well, I don't know why I'm doing this, um, on uh, just for information purposes, it really doesn't impact this class, but it may impact students. That's why I'm putting on students this, so probably by the time this gets loaded, students probably even will already be passed. But, this afternoon from, I think, around 2.30 to 4.30, there is a faculty staff meeting across the way here in the Ethel Hall Auditorium. Um, so if you have a class in that time frame, check with your instructor, check on Blackboard or something to see if the class is meeting. Uh, if you have an adjunct instructor, the odds are the class will meet because there's adjunct instructors typically don't go to faculty staff meetings. Uh, if it's a full-time instructor, they may or may or may not have gotten permission to continue the class or to go to the, the other thing. For instance, I'm teaching an afternoon class. It's a mini-term class, so to lose two hours of that class is, you know, and right in the middle of it, it it's not good for the students, and uh, we probably wouldn't be able to finish all the material we needed. Because the odds are, if they had to sit for two hours, they're going home on a Thursday evening. So I got permission not to go to the faculty staff meeting. Oh, shucks. Okay, now I'll try to get over it. Now, uh, any questions on anything we've covered so far? All right. Glad you're here. I hate talking to myself, but uh, my largest class to have only one student present, though I know another one's probably coming, a little disheartening. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it must be my scintillating personality. Okay. Uh, synthetic division is the next topic, and I think y'all, some of you said you were already familiar with it, so we'll probably do it fairly quickly. I hope so anyway. There's a nice shortcut for long division of polynomials as long as you have a divisor in the form of x minus k. Okay? If you have an x squared minus k, you can't use synthetic division. If you have a 2x minus k. You can't use the synthetic division. You have to have a naked x here and plus or minus k. The plus or minus doesn't matter. Okay? Now, here's uh, how I phrase it. Okay? The coefficient of x must be 1. The exponent of x must be 1. That is a requirement for you to do synthetic division. The divisor must meet that. The pattern for a synthetic division of a cubic polynomial is summarized as follows. Now, this is cubic. It can go as high as you want to. Okay? So you have ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d divided by x minus k. Now, without telling you why, but if you think back on our long division, remember when we were doing your division, we double the class size, okay? Jeremy's here. Okay. Um, when we're doing the long division, you chose your divide, you know, the elements in the quotient and everywhere else, so that when you multiply, you wiped out that first term. You wiped out the first term. You wiped out the first term. So the key from having to wipe out the first term, you just won't write it down. Okay. Okay, now, the other thing, if you remember we did, when you were doing the subtraction, my advice to you was change signs and add. Change signs and add. Change signs and add. Because when you're dealing with sign numbers, that should be a little better. So, since you got those things by multiplying, okay, remember when you multiply the thing up here, whatever it was, x to the seventh, you know, x squared, whatever, you multiply by this, you wipe out that term. When you multiply by this, you write down that term, and then you change the sign. So why not just change the sign to begin with? So we'll change the sign. If this is minus k, we'll put plus k. If it's plus k, we'll put minus k. Okay? So that's what we put outside here. Whatever follows the minus sign, we'll put that value. If that was a plus sign, then that would be a minus k. All right. And then you'll also remember that the first uh, 
coefficient always came down, especially if this is a 1 here. You did 1 into A. That's always A. So the A always showed up down below. Increase the class size by 50%. Ryan's here. I've just got to find you in the... There you are. Alphabet. Okay. So far, the Y chromosomes are doing fairly well. One X chromosome well. I call them Jonathan, but you know, we'll, we'll see. Okay. So, this is how we're going to start off. Okay? Now, what we're going to do... Like we, oh, and notice... What did the X's do in that? It just gave you something else to write. To call it the O's. So if you leave off the X's in your dividend, just put the coefficients. That's the only thing that's really changing because you're subtracting off the X's anyway. Yeah, you need them at the end, so at the end we'll throw them back in. Okay? And here's Tyrell. He's still on the roll. There he is. Oh, and I guess there's one other announcement. Uh, I need to make. Remember I was warning y'all for about a week or two that around midterm they usually open no, on the calendar it says we're to do midterm progress reports. Okay? Um, well, they didn't. <laughs> the week after midterm thought it was through. Then something like yesterday or the day before the dean said, oh you got to do midterm progress reports. They do now. I don't know, put a deadline, but she said they had to be done. So last night I did have a little time in the office, so I got those done. Most of this class, as far as I can remember, you know, no sweat. There were a couple I think who haven't. Generally, who haven't been here, or even if they haven't have been here, they haven't turned in anything yet. Of course, I had to uh, submit that they had else at midterm. So. If you hear wailing and gnashing of teeth, that may be part of it. All right. So, again, we leave off the variables for now. What we're going to do at the end is put them back in. But why write them all those steps in between when you don't really use them so much? Okay? So, what we do is write down our coefficients. And remember, even if we're doing long division, what happens if we're missing a term? You put what? Zero. So your coefficient, if you're missing one of those terms, be sure you put a zero in. So that C could be a zero. B could be a zero. Should A be a zero? No, because that's the one that can't be a zero. All right. But any of the others could be. All right. We leave off the coefficients. We forget about the X here too, but change the sign of K. And then we start to proceed. We break down the A. Uh, okay, now here's the step. The books never say, and it's just a dumb thing I say, skip a line, draw a line, okay? It's a dumb thing to do just to get you going. And then bring down the A, and then multiply K times A, put it here, add it to B. Now remember, that's just a number. It's not going to be letters. These are all going to be numbers. Add it to that. Multiply, add, multiply, add. And whatever your last one is, that's your remainder. Always. Okay? So the pattern here, add the things in columns, but you got to multiply first. Multiply diagonally and, and, um, okay. and whatever shows up here is your remainder. So I sort of block that off. Then I count back, and this is the x to the zero term, or whatever your variable is that is here, x to the first, x to the second. And sure enough, this, if you're dividing x into something x cubed, that's going, the coefficient is the same here, the variable is going to be 1 power less, x squared. Okay? And there you have the result. So this, a is always the same, so if this coefficient is 1, the power is 1 less if that exponent is 1. And those are the requirements to do synthetic division. Okay, this algorithm for synthetic division works only for divisors of this form, x minus k. This is like the second or third time they said it, and I'm focusing on it, and here's how I look at it. The coefficient of the variable has to be 1, the exponent of the variable has to be 1. As I said before, some of you got here, 
If this was 2x minus k, you can't use synthetic division. If this was x squared minus k, you can't use synthetic division. Only if this is 1x, x to the one x to the first power. Oh, we finally get an x chromosome to show up. Okay, well, she was here first, actually. But then she left and tells her Johnson. Okay, all right. Now, uh, remember that if that was a plus sign there, then your k is negative because it's always going to be x minus k. So what goes out front is a minus k. So if it's minus k here, a plus k goes out front. If it's a plus k here, a minus k goes out Okay, does that kind of make sense? Let's do one. All right. You tell me what to put where. I will get you started by drawing. I don't quite draw it. I don't quite draw it the way the book. We're in on example four on page 141, section 2.3. Okay, let me get a dark color here. Okay. All right. I'm going to set up here. I do it like this. What goes in that little block? Negative three. Okay, wait. Time out before we even do that. Does this qualify to use synthetic division? Why? Coefficient of one, exponent of one for your variable and your divisor. Yes. So then what do we do? We take the number part here, change the sign, and put it here. Okay? That's not how the book says it, but that's what you do. Now, what you go, there's not really a box there, but on the other side of the line, what goes there? One, zero. You got to account for every term. Negative 10, keep the sign with it. Negative 2, 4. Here's a little check, folks. What's the power of the, the degree of this polynomial? How many? Numbers that you better have here? Five. One more than that, always. I always count. One, two, three, four, five. One more than that? Yes, we've got it. Because if you've forgotten to do the zero here and just put down four terms, look at that and say, something's wrong. Oh, missing a term there. Put in a zero. Okay. Next little rule. This is my rule. No book says it. Skip a line, draw a line. Okay. Now. What is next step? Bring down the 1. Multiply negative 3 times 1, negative 3. And then add 0 plus negative 3 is negative 3. Then multiply negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. Then add, you get a negative 1. Then you multiply negative 3 times negative 1 is 3, then you add and you get a 1, then you multiply, you get a negative 3, and then you add and you get a 1. That's a remainder, block it off. Okay? So it sort of looked kind of symmetric. We'll block it, we got, yeah, I like that. Never mind. Okay. Now, what does this tell you? Okay. Your, what you did, you dropped your variables when you wrote that line, just wrote the coefficients. Now you put the variable back in, but how do we put it in? One less than what it was before. So what is this? X cubed squared minus X plus one with a remainder of one. I don't care how you write that. Okay. But I do care the essence here. Okay. Anyone else come in since I called off? Okay. Now, actually, I think the better way to write that, I mean, I can remember in grammar school writing remainder one, but really, now I think the best way to write that would be plus one over x plus three. Remind you that that is... Oh, we did. So here's the question, remainder of the divisor. Okay? That's one way to write the answer. You can write remainder one, that's fine. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay, that's how we did it. Let's see how they did it. All right, we
We're doing synthetic division. All right, we'll go through the steps again. Okay, first thing you do, now they don't write it right, but you, you get the general idea. Okay, you should set up an array as follows, uh, and they note, just like Jonathan taught, we're missing an x cubed term. So you got to put a zero in there. Okay? Time out again, before we start, since some people have come in since we started this. Does this even qualify for synthetic division? Look at the divisor. What's the requirement here? Coefficient of 1, exponent 1 for your variable. You can only have a naked x there, or whatever your variable is. No coefficient except 1, no exponent except 1. Okay? So, it does qualify. What do you do with the divisor then? Change the sign of the number. Put it here. Notice we're losing all the variables for now. We're going to put them back in when we need to. Because that was just extra writing. And we're lazy, right? Really lazy. Okay. So, leave off the variables and just put a minus 3 there. Why was that? Remember before, we always change signs add, change signs there. Don't you just multiply by a minus, and then you just add. So you don't have to change signs. You've done it already. All right, side the point. Then what do you put next? You got the minus 3 out here. I like to have a little block there. They don't see it. Okay. Then what? The coefficients. Well, this could have a coefficient other than 1. It doesn't. That's a 1. And then as we noted, you're missing a cube term, so that's a 0. Then a minus 10 from here, a minus 2 from there, and a 4 from there. And again, I suggest to, to you, always go back and count how many numbers you wrote here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Correct number because it's one more than your degree. Always. If it's not, you've left off a term. If it's two more than 2, you've written a term twice or something weird. Okay. So, now you have it set up, and then I do a little dumb rule. Skip a line, draw a line, okay? Sort of dumb, you'll never see it in a book, okay? Bring down the first coefficient, in this case a 1. And then what do we do? Multiply diagonally, minus 3 times 1, negative 3, write that there. Then you add 0 plus negative 3, negative 3. Then you multiply, negative 3 times negative 3, Positive 9. Then you add negative 10 plus 9, negative 1. Then you multiply. Negative 3 times negative 1 is positive 3. Then you add negative 2 plus 3 is 1. Then you multiply. Negative 3 times 1 is negative 3. Then you add 4 minus 3 is 1. Block that off. That's the remainder. Okay, we've done it again, and that's exactly what we got. Now, they didn't block it off. I think it's a good idea to block it off. Uh, so that's the remainder of one. Okay, what is this? These are the coefficients of our quotient. These are the coefficients of the dividend, the coefficients of the quotient. Okay, now, notice, because this had degree one, then this is always one less than the degree here. So you start off with your x cubed term on your quotient. x cubed minus 3x squared minus x plus 1 with a remainder 1. There's your quotient. There's your remainder. So you fill in the blanks there. This is where you put the variables back in. You took them out up here. You put them back here. But always drop by 1. Okay, the first one. And then you count down in order. Now, if you wound up with a zero here, that's the skip term. But yeah, that would have been uh, x cubed if this was a zero minus x. Okay, you skip the term with a zero. Does that make sense? Pretty easy process. I'm a little hesitant now. I don't know if, I don't think it was this class, was it? That when I sat down to do something here, my cord here got caught under this little handle. And when I moved over here, it yanked the computer onto the floor. Big crash. Fortunately, it's an old enough computer it didn't break. Okay, so anyway, there is your result. Now, I know Ashland prefers long division because it just is more satisfying to do all that work, right?
synthetic vision much shorter. Okay, so we have, and here's one way to write the answer. This is what I call the division way. The, divisor, the dividend divided by the divisor, that's what you're told to do, is equal to the quotient plus one over the, plus remainder over the divisor. Okay? And I don't know if they write it the other way. No, I guess they don't. So that was example four. Any questions on that? If you have any doubt about it, please do the checkpoint. If you want just a refresher, do the checkpoint. All right. Back in Math 100, I think they spent a lot more time on this. They're assuming, I think you had it, one example, on to the next. So let's look at the remainder and the factor theorems. Now I'm going to go back in time, one slide. Our remainder of one, and we know what to do with it, put it over the divisor. Does that remainder tell us anything else? Let's do this. How about it? Okay? When we had the divisor of x plus 3, okay, it's not really a factor, but if you were to write that as a factor, uh, if you said, well, what if x is equal to this thing, negative 3? In other words, subtract 3 from both sides. You don't have an equation there, but just imagine you did. So x equal negative 3. Okay, now what I want you to do, not going to be trivial, okay, but we could do it, is plug in negative 3 everywhere you have an x in that dividend, okay? So what's negative 3 to the 4th power? Does anyone know? Easy way to do it is negative 3 times negative 3 is? Say again. Not negative. Positive, because you have an even number of factors. Think of it this way. Negative 3 times negative 3 is? Positive 9. Negative 3 times negative 3 is? Positive 9. 9 times 9 is 81. Okay. So this is 81 minus 10 times, and what's negative 3 squared? Positive 9 minus 2 times second, negative 3 plus 4. Okay? Well, let's see what we get. 81 minus 90 plus 6 plus 4. Say again. Say again. Positive 1. What was our remainder? All lucky that time, weren't we? No, indeed. And which was easier, doing synthetic division or multiplying all the results and adding? Synthetic division. All you that division is so easy. All you do is add and multiply. You don't raise anything to the power. Okay. But yeah, you can do it either way you want to. But this gives you another way to evaluate a polynomial. You don't have to raise. If that were something to the 17th power, yeah, try that then. Okay. Okay. At some point there, it's going to be easier to do synthetic division. Because all you do here, multiply and add, multiply and add, multiply and add. And they're pretty simple at processes. The numbers can get big or small, but you know, and they can even have fractions, fine, but if you had fractions in that, that would be really miserable. All right, I shouldn't have done that. I jumped ahead. The remainder obtained in synthetic division process, or even in long division process, but especially synthetic division process. Why synthetic division process? What degree is your remainder always in synthetic division? Actually, degree zero. Because your divisor is always degree one. Because the maximum x1 is one. Remember, that's the rule. You can't do it if it's not. And the remainder always has to be lower degree than the divisor. Never equal. Lower. So it has to be zero. In other words, it's going to have just a pure number. Okay? So every time you use synthetic division, 
Not every time you could use it, but just every time you used it. Because if your divisor has been 2x plus 3, you can't use subtraction 3. So if you've done division with that, then, oh no, not quite. This works best with subtraction 3. Let's look at least like that. Has an important the remainder obtained has an important interpretation described here. If a polynomial f of x is divided by x minus k, which means you can use synthetic division, then the remainder is always now r is equal to now from k, whatever that k was. So even if this was a 2x minus k, you can't use this rule because that 2 screwed things up. Okay? So if you had divided by this, your remainder is alpha k. So if you can use synthetic division, the remainder would be that. Even if you lose long division, it would still be that. The remainder theorem tells you that synthetic division can be used to evaluate a polynomial function, especially if it's a big, long, hairy one that you don't want to raise all those powers. Use synthetic division, which only additions and uh, multiplication. Okay? That is to evaluate polynomial function alpha of x when x is equal to k. You see, that's what we do with x equal k. You would move this to the other side, and that's what becomes x equal k. Divide f of x by x minus k. The remainder will be alpha of k. Whatever that k is, put it into your function. That's going to give you the remainder. In other words, this is how you get it. So, let's do example five. Use the remainder theorem to evaluate f of x is equal to 3x cubed plus 8x squared plus 5x minus 7 when x equal negative 2. How would you approach this problem? Yeah, he's going to do it that way no matter what, isn't he? We'll come back and check it that way. Okay, it says use the remainder theorem to evaluate it. How would you do that? What do you put where? I'll get you started. Say again? You put the negative 2 in there. If it's written as a factor, which it may not be a factor, but if written that way in parentheses, put the opposite of this. If you write it as equal, put that number. Okay, and what do we put here? 3, 8, 5, negative 7. And then we do what? Skip a line, draw a line. Then we do what? Drop the 3, okay? Then you multiply. Then you. And you get a 2. Negative 4. 1. Add, you get. Okay. Normally, we'd be saying that's negative. Now, we don't care what the quotient is. We want to know what the value is, okay? And I contend f of negative 2 is equal to negative now. Now we're going to check it. What is f? We'll do it. Jonathan's way. Now that Justin's coming in, I'll let him do that. Okay. Has anyone else come in since the called roll? Okay. Let's do f of negative 2. And that would be 3 times. Say again. Negative 8 plus 8 times 4, plus 5 times negative 2, minus 7. 3 times negative 8 is negative 24, plus 32, minus 10, minus 7. Okay, that's minus 34, Minus 41 plus 32 equal, ding, 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 we got it, okay? You decide what you'd rather do. I don't care how you do it, uh, but especially for high powers and relatively large numbers, I think synthetic division will usually win the win the race for you. Okay? Now, that was example five. 
There is a checkpoint here. I highly recommend you do it. They give you four to do, okay? And one of those being a fraction. So try it with that too. Do your checkpoints. Any questions? We're on page 142. We just finished uh, example five. We're about to move to the top of a, oh wait. We gotta see how they did it. So let me erase all my ink. And let's see how they did it. Well, they wrote it down with the minus two on the outside. As you just came in, if you're doing long division, I mean, synthetic division, the divisor would have been x plus 2, because you add 2 to both sides. If you're doing, if you're evaluating whatever x is equal, that's what goes out here. If you're doing division, and this is in x plus 2, you put the opposite of the 2 out here. Okay. It's the same number, okay, but you do it in a different way. Okay? Put that on the outside. I usually draw a block here, skip a line, draw a line, bring down to 3, multiply, negative 2 times 3 is negative 6, add 8 minus 6 is 2, multiply negative 2 times 2 is negative 4, add 5 minus 4 is 1, multiply negative 2 times 1 is negative 2, add negative 7 minus 2 is minus 9. That is f of negative 2. It's the remainder in synthetic division. It's the evaluation of your <coughs> polynomial. Interesting. Okay? Now, with that done, I want to ask you a question. What if this hadn't been a minus 9, but had been a 0? What would that be? that x plus 2 would have been a factor. It's not a factor of that one, but it would have been a factor of that in case. In fact, if you you have to add 9 here to add 9 to that, if that had been a plus 2, I think you would have wound up. Yep. If that had been a plus 2, that would have been a 0. That would have been a minus 7. Okay? So, uh, that's what, okay. Because the remainder is, I'm sorry, didn't do the last slide here. Because the remainder is minus 9, you can conclude that alpha of negative 2 is negative 9. That's your, re your remainder theorem. And that means negative 2, negative 9 is a point on the graph of alpha. You can check that by substituting negative 2 in the original formula, which they do here, which we did. Alpha of negative 2 is 3 times negative 2 cubed plus 8 times negative 2 squared plus 5 times negative 2 minus 7 which is 3 times negative 8 plus 8 times 4 plus minus 10 minus 7, which is negative 24 plus 32, negative 10 minus 7, and that adds to be minus 9, which we did. All right. So another important theorem, we've had the uh, remainder theorem, and now the factor theorem, okay? We just hit it, okay? Factor theorem, a polynomial f of x has a factor of x minus k if and only if f of k is 0. Right? Okay? If you were to put this into the polynomial, that meant that this was a factor of the polynomial. If you put that in, you get a 0, and you found a 0 for the polynomial, and then you just said x minus k is the, is the factor. Well, guess what? It's a factor if and only if that's true. Well, how can we do that? Synthetic division or plugging in, either way. So use, using the factor theorem, you can test whether the polynomial has x minus k as a factor by evaluating x equal k. If the result is 0, x minus k is a factor. If the result is not 0, it's not a factor. So you, you can't use it as a factor. So, this is all leading somewhere. Hopefully you should suspect that. Where is it leading? All right. Here's one part. Okay. Now they're doing the hard work for you. It says show that x minus 2 and x plus 3 are factors of that big old long 
cortic polynomial. Okay? Then I find the remaining factors. So how can you do this? How can you show those are factors? Use synthetic division. What goes outside the house? Two. Okay, what goes on the other side? Two. Seven. Negative four. Negative 27? Negative 18? Oh, it's looking bad, isn't it? Okay. Now, what I always do, and literally I do this, I go and count my numbers. One, two, three, four, five. My heart. Why do I do that? This, the number of numbers you have here, it better be one more than that. If it isn't, go back and check. You skipped the term somewhere. You left off a number somewhere. It's got to be one more than the three of the number. Okay, no. Now, I haven't said this, but I hope you've realized. Before you even try this, be sure your polynomial is in descending order of your powers. Don't be putting those coefficients out of order. Ain't it going to work then? Okay. Then what do we do? Skip a line, draw a line. Then what? Bring down the 2. Then multiply. 2 times 2. 4. Then add. What does that give you? 11. All right. Good morning, Vietnam. Okay. Multiply. 22. Add, you get what? 18. Whoo, number's getting big. This doesn't look like it's going to get to zero, is it? 36. 9. 18. Zero. Ding, 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 ding. Guess what? X minus 2 is a factor you've just shown it. And this is another factor. Of course, this represents what? 2x cubed plus 11x squared plus 18x plus 9. Okay. What is the other thing they ask us to do? Show that x plus 3 is also a factor. Do we have to go back and do a 3 into this? No. If x plus 3 is a factor of this, it will also be a factor of this, because that was an exact factor, right? So don't go back to the hard one. Be lazy like excellent, okay? And divide what? Say again? Negative 3 in there, and then we do what? Skip a line, draw a line. Bring down your 2. And what you get? Negative 6, positive 5, negative 15, 3, negative 9, 0. Ding, ding, ding again. We did have, this shows that x plus 3 indeed was a factor because the remainder was 0. Now, what does this represent? 2x squared plus 5x plus 3. Do we need to know another zero? Because this is a quadratic. And let's write it down the way we said. And there's Brianna. All right. Um, and since so several people have come in, as soon as I finish this problem, remind me to, to make one of my earlier announcements again, just to read. Because several people have come in. Okay, so how can, you just told me that was 2x squared plus 5x plus 3. It says find the remaining factors. Yes. Yes. So does that mean it will be a factor of that zero? Okay, yeah. Is that 
what, what we're saying. Because, because this was a zero, that meant x plus minus 2 was a factor of the original. Which means this thing, which is 2x cubed plus 11x squared plus 18x plus 9, that's also a factor of that thing. There are both factors. This is a factor, there is a factor. You multiply them together. And since this is a factor of that, if that is also a factor of this one, it's got to be a factor of this one as well. Okay. So part of it was I was being lazy because this is easier to do because you only got four terms there and you have five there. And you're guaranteed to work. If that was a zero there, <coughs> you can continue doing this. If that wasn't a zero, hang it up there. That wasn't a factor to begin with. Then you would have gone back and tried minus three into that one to see if that was a factor. Okay. But the other reason I was lazy again, okay, I'm double lazy. Because by doing into here, if you went into here, you'd have another cu uh, cubic polynomial. That wouldn't tell you what your final factor would be. That would just tell you the other factor of the x minus 2 still included it. So if you do it into this one, that breaks you down to a quadratic. And quadratics we can deal with either by factoring or quadratic formula. So don't try any more synthetic division. Just factor it if you can. Well, let's see if we can. What is the only possible factorization for 2x squared? 2x times x. Then where do we look? The sine of the last term. What is it? Plus. What does that tell you about these two signs? They've got to be the same. So you look at the middle sign and see it's a plus. So these two both have to be pluses. If that middle had been a minus, then they'd both have to be minuses, if that last one's a plus. Okay, now what's the only possible factorization for 3? Three? 3 and 1. Let's write it down that way and see if it works. This is trial and error, so you better check it to make sure you haven't made an error. 2x times x. 2x squared. We got it. 2x times 1. 2x. 3x, 3 times x, plus 3x. Yes, we got the plus 5x, and then plus 3. Yep, it worked. No wonder he's smiling, okay, because it worked, right? Okay, so we found all the factorizations. X, find the remaining factors. Here they are. There's one, there's one. So our total factorization would be x minus 2 times x plus 3 times 2x plus 3 times x plus 1. Now, you could have done long division. She liked to work hard, I can tell. So, no, 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 okay, all right, all right. Long division is, I mean, yeah, long division is hard. Yeah, okay. Yes, you could have used long division. You'd have gotten the same results. You'd have been a lot harder. What's that? Synthetic? Yeah. You tell me. Yeah. Okay, if you'd have done this one, x <coughs> minus 2 into all that thing, I'd have had to start on another board to do the next part. And this, I got both parts here and factored out over there. It's a lot shorter, but sure enough, you can do long division if you choose. Now, Here's the other thing I wanted to point out. Could you have found either of those other two factors using synthetic division? You could have gotten this one, but this one doesn't qualify for synthetic division. Why not? It doesn't have a one as a coefficient. You're absolutely right. Okay, But by doing your factorization on that last one, quadratic, yeah, didn't matter. And you knew all along that some factor of this is going to have to have a 2 coefficient. It's got to. Well, if I multiply and get a 2 here, one of those factors would have to have a 2. And we found one. Okay. Okay. What we did, they told us the two, uh, they said, show that those are factors. And we showed it by dividing. Uh, 
using synthetic division. But a long division would work too. If you wind up with a remainder of zero, it is a factor. When you do it again, wind up with a remainder of zero, that's a factor. So now you know that's also a factor. So this is a quadratic solution factor that by hand. Now even if you can't factor it by hand, you can use quadratic formula on it and say you came up with uh, uh, 2x plus the square root of 3, x minus the square root of 2, or something like that, some weird thing like that, then what would you have done? You would have, uh, you could have written those as factors and they would work too. You just have radical. Factoring like this, unfoiling, only gives you the uh, whole number factors, well, not an integer factor. If you had radical factors, you'd have to use a quadratic formula. Okay, good deal. That's us doing it. Let's see how they did it. All right. First thing they did, use synthetic division with the first factor. What do you do synthetic division? The opposite of the two there. Forget the x's, okay, for now. Forget the x's, and that gave you, and then change the sign of the two. Put the two on the outside, skip a line, draw a line. Oh, two on the outside, and then put the coefficients of the dividend. Two, seven, negative four, negative 27, negative 18. Stop there. Count how many numbers you have. Five has to be one more than the three. Also, be sure before you even did that that you have it in decreasing order of your powers. Okay, you've got it. So you know you got it right. If you had skipped a term, that means you had to put a zero somewhere. Okay, so you're okay. Now, skip a line, draw a line, bring down the two, then multiply on the diagonal, 2 times 2 is 4, add vertically, 7 plus 4 is 11, multiply again, 2 times 11 is 22, add vertically, negative 4 plus 22 is 18, multiply diagonally, 2 times 18 is 36, add vertically, negative 27 plus 36 is positive 9, multiply diagonally, 2 times 9 is 18, negative 18 plus 18 is 0, ding, ding, ding. Recall that's the zero remainder. Always that last term, that last number is your remainder. If it's a zero, that means that was a factor. Okay? X minus two was a factor. Now, if x minus two was a factor, that means this thing was a factor too. Two x cubed plus eleven x squared plus eighteen x plus nine. That's also a factor. That's where you put your x's back in, but you don't have to. If that's a factor, then X plus 3, if that's going to be a factor of the purple, it'll be a factor here. If that hasn't been a factor here, then you stop. It's not a factor. You can't do, do it anymore. You have to try something else. So what we're going to do is take those numbers there and do your, what do you divide into it? Negative 3. Okay, so that's what they do next. So negative 3 on the outside. They took those numbers we had left over, your quotient, and skip a line, draw a line. Bring down the 2 again, multiply diagonally, negative 3 times 2 is negative 6, add vertically, 11 minus 6 is 5, multiply diagonally, negative 3 times 5 is negative 16, add vertically, negative 18 plus, I mean, 18 minus 15 is 3, multiply diagonally, minus 3 times 3 is negative 9, ding, 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 9 minus 9 is 0, that is a factor as well. And it tells you this is a factor. 2x squared plus 5x plus 3 is a factor. Once you get it to three numbers down at the bottom in your quotient, you know that represents a quadratic. Stop there. Factor that by hand. Don't try synthetic division anymore. Usually it's easier to factor by hand. If you can't factor it, use the quadratic formula. You will not be able to factor it anyway. Okay. So that's what we do next. Say that one more time. Okay. Uh, let's back up a step. Remember, this is the x to the fourth. 
We're dividing it by an x. So that gives us this x cubed. That drops by 1. And then since this is x cubed, that's x squared, that's x, and that's the whole number. Okay, when you do it again, and do an x into it again, the cube becomes a square. Okay, so every time you decrease that. But, if this is three numbers here, you know the last is going to be a number to the first power to the second power. So you can count the other way. So, yeah. Every time you do a synthetic division, you're dividing by an x, the number, so it drops the power by one. You did two of them from a four, that left you a three. So, we've got a quadratic, and we just did it. We're going to factor that baby, and they factored it too. Look at that. They got it right too. I'm so proud of them. So, the complete factorization of that first big old hairy f of x we had with the four powers, that comes to 2x minus 2 times x plus 3 times 2x plus 3 times x plus 1. There's your complete factorization. Weren't able to do that before. Now, granted, they gave you two factors. Guess what? Not always going to give you two factors. In fact, not even going to give you one factor. We're going to have to find our own factors. Oh, how sad. But we can handle it. Okay? But for right now, we have finished section 2.3. Almost. There is a checkpoint after example 6. And there's vocabulary. So let's do the vocabulary. Two forms of the division algorithms are shown below. Identify and label each term in the function. Okay, that's going to disappear, so let me do them here. Here's this one. Forget that. Okay. Uh, f of x is equal to d of x times q of x plus r of x. And the other one is f of x divided by d of x is equal to q of x plus r of x of x over d of x. What do those things stand for? What's your f of x in both cases? Your what? It's your function, and what do we, we have a special name for? You earn it when you have money in the bank. A dividend! Very good, okay. Y'all don't have money in the bank, huh? Oh, never mind. No, okay. Now, <laughs> Not that funny. Okay, what's your d of x? Your divisor. What's your q of x? Oh, how clever they named these except for the f. And what's your r of x? The remainder. In either form, they all stand for the same thing. I think that's all they're asking for. Okay, in the next of these, 2 through 6, fill in the blanks. In the division algorithm, the rational expression r of x over d of x is blank because the degree of r of x is always less than the degree of d of x. What do we call that? What we fill in that blank? Top of page 144. If that was a fraction, it could have been two-thirds. What would we call two-thirds? When you drink your tea, you hold up your pinky. Proper! Okay, very good. Okay. It's a proper uh, rational expression. It's proper. Okay, and number three. In the division algorithm right there, the rational expression f of x over d of x is blank because the degree of f of x is greater than or equal to the degree of d of x. Improper. You don't hold up your pinky. Okay. Now, number four. An alternative method to long division of polynomials is called blank blank, in which the divisor must be of the form x minus k. Synthetic division. Very good. Okay. And number uh, five, the blank theorem states that if a, poly that a polynomial function has a factor x minus k, if and only if f of k is equal to zero. Factor theorem. The blank theorem states that a polynomial f of x is divided by um, uh, x minus k, then the remainder is the remainder 
R is F of K. Remainder theorem, very good. Homework exercises. Do number seven, everybody. Do number nine, everybody. And then do any of the odds 11 through 25. Do several of those. Then do any of the odds 27 through 45. Those are new ones that I haven't assigned to you before because we just did synthetic division today. Then do any of the odds 47 to 53. And then do either 55 or 57 or both. You choose. They have four parts each, so I'll let you choose. Then do any of the odds 59 through 65. Do any of the odds 67 through 73. Do any of the odds 75 to 79. And do either 81 or 83 or both if you choose. And then there's one. No, sorry. Yeah, yeah, there is. There's just one odd application problem. Please do that one. Then it's not a bad idea to look at exploration. Uh, there's a couple true false. I think 87 have 89 have the answers in the back, so you try to do one or both of those. And then think about it, which means think about it. You don't have to really do much with it if you don't want to, but uh, 91 or 93. And then try to do 95. This pretty interesting little problem. Okay, it's just got a C in there. You got to figure out sort of what we did on one before. What makes that a perfect factor? What C would you use? All right. Any questions? Um, yes. I can't hear. When are you going to do? Okay. You mean the quiz? Yeah, I gave out the quiz last time, so if you weren't here to pick it up, let me give you the quiz right now. And it's not just on this section, on the first three sections, okay, in chapter two. I know they're hiding in here somewhere. Goodness gracious. Wait, wait, I'm too deep. Ah, I found them finally. Okay. Now, I'm running a bit short on graph paper, so I might have to dig around and find some more graph paper. Uh, hold on just a second. In fact, I might have to run. Ah, here's some. I knew there was some in here. Whoa, there's only one sheet. What's that? <laughs> okay. Are you the only one that needs one? Anyone else need quiz? Oh, there's some more. There's the graph paper. Anyone else need quiz too? Okay. You need graph paper? Um, you don't need that. All right. There is one graph, number one. Okay. All right. Any questions then on 2.3? Okay. Now, all right. All right, we've got about seven more minutes. Let's move on to 2.4. Now, I know y'all remember that. Whoa! I didn't do that, did I? I'm afraid I did. Yuck. Hit the wrong button. Okay, here we go again. So close. All right, 2.4. Here's what I was going to say. I know that all of you remember very clearly when we did the syllabus. What was the course description? Y'all been reading the syllabus every day, haven't you? 
You should have memorized it by now. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sort of. Okay. Uh, we're still in Chapter 2, Polynomial Rational Functions, but 2.4 says complex numbers. Now, I'm guessing most of you do know what we mean by that. Okay. Do you remember in the course description when they talked about it? No. They didn't talk about it in the courses in the course description. That means we're really not required to do them. Okay? However, so I cause you may run into them sometime in your future. I'm going to try to zip through this as fast as possible just to expose you to them, but you're not going to be responsible for them. You do need to know a little something about them because they will pop up every now and then, and you need to know, oh, that's what that is. Okay, we're not going to do that. Okay. So our objectives here that we're going, I'm going to do in great detail, use the imaginary unit I to write complex numbers. We'll add, subtract, and multiply complex numbers, or at least I'll show you how to. We'll use complex conjugates, which is an important concept too, to write the quotient of two complex numbers in standard form. And we'll find complex solutions to quadratic equations. We really won't do much of that. But let's first start with the imaginary unit I, OK? I think we've talked about before that certain quadratic, well, quadratic equations, remember we said, how, is, how many is the most number of solutions you can have for a quadratic equation? Two, because the maximum exponent is two. Okay? You could only have one, or you could have none. Okay? Now, Two would be if that, and what time was the quadratic function graph as a parabola? If the parabola does something like that, it calls the dx vanishes and replaces. If it does something like this, it calls the dx vanishes and replaces. Those are your solutions. <coughs> and when do you only have one? If the road comes down and touches the x axis but goes back in the same direction. Okay, I call it just the x axis. Okay? But doesn't cross it. Then you call that a double root because remember, if it touches but doesn't cross, you have the most even multiplicity, and since the most you can have is two, that's a double root. But what is it when it does like this or like that and never crosses the x axis? It still has two solutions. They're just not real numbers, they are complex numbers. Okay? And we would have to use the imaginary unit to express it. So here's one. x squared plus 1 equals 0. Can that ever happen? Not in the real number system. Give me a real number, any real number. Make it as weird as you want to make it. A real number. 2. Okay, really weird. Okay, 2 squared is plus 1 is. Okay, that's not ever going to be 0. So let's make it a minus 2, okay? Minus 2 squared is 4 plus 1 is 5. That's never going to be 0, okay? How about making it 0? 0 squared plus 1 is? That's never going to be 0. What if you have a radical, a negative radical, or any? No, they're never going to be, because you square any real number, it's always positive, you add 1 or, or 0. You add one to it, it's always going to be positive. It will never, ever, ever be zero. So it has no real solution. There is no real number. You can square it, add it to one, and get a zero. That would require x squared to be a negative one. And it just can't happen in the real number system. So to overcome, if you thought that was a deficiency, mathematicians have created an expanded system of numbers using the imaginary unit i. And here's what the imaginary unit i is. One simple little number is the square root of negative one, which you can't have as a real number, but you can as an imaginary unit. Now, another way to express it, what happens if you square both sides of that equation? i squared is equal to negative one. So there you could have i squared <coughs> equal negative one if you have i is equal to the square root of negative one. Not a real number, an imaginary. Okay, and that's why we call it the imaginary unit. Okay. 
Okay. My a okay. So I'm going to start over way back. What's the first thing that Matthew ever learned to do? <coughs> count. And what did you use to count? What was that? Use the count. Or those if you had to keep them. Okay. But what you used, the numbers that you used were called counting numbers. There was another name for them, natural numbers. Just the numbers you used to count. And then they came up with, well, we need to add one more really important little number that doesn't get to work much to the counting numbers, and that gave you zero. That gives you the whole number. There's another set of numbers, the whole number. And then at some point or another, which is probably much later, you started the negative of those uh, natural numbers. Now what do we call that set? Okay. Well, that, the number one contains more than those. If you're adding up plus or minus natural numbers or counting numbers, and zero, those are your integers. Okay. Now, after the integers, we started dividing. We had to have the integers because when you subtract the bigger numbers from smaller numbers, you got negative numbers. So that's why we had to have integers. But then we started dividing. And when you divided, you wound up with sometimes fractions. So fractions, when you add those, any fraction basically is a ratio of two integers. As long as the bottom integer was not what did we have the fraction? Zero. Okay, so what do we call that set of numbers? Ratio of two integers. What do we call it? Rational numbers, ratio, ratio null numbers, okay? Rational numbers, okay? Now, rational numbers were also numbers you could express the problem of time. It's sad news, okay? Rational numbers you could also, also express as fractions or decimals as long as the decimal is terminated or repeated. But then sometime much later we ran into numbers that were never repeated. Didn't terminate and they didn't repeat. And what do we call this? Irrational numbers. Has nothing to do with gender either. Okay, nothing we want to go. Okay, so I didn't say that. Okay. All right. So irrational numbers. Give me a few examples. Pi. Yes, I love pi. Okay. E. Square root of 2. Square root of 3. Square root of 5. Square root of 6. Square root of 7. All those are irrational numbers. Never repeat. When you combine rational and irrational numbers, we have, that's when you get to number lines. Real number lines. So now we have to come up with some new ones, and that's where we'll begin next time. And that paragraph right there, and I'll try not to talk too much about it, okay? Um, we'll start right there next time. Okay. What's that? Oh, yeah, the announcement.